Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please find a seat. Uh, some open seats, uh, take, take them. We'll get, get started after our uh, what turned out to be a security false alarm, I'm very happy to say. We, uh, but everything's safe, and the security officer of the hotel assures us that everything's fine. But uh, I want to start by saying I'm Wayne Lord, president of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Uh, it is a great privilege to uh, be here for our, the program we call Central Europe's V4. Uh, the Visegrad four countries, uh, it, it is quite remarkable, as many of you know. Uh, I have a history background of some time ago, uh, and it's only coming out of a European uh, meeting of this kind with four uh, amazing ambassadors from the, the heart of Europe uh, that we would have a, an organization, their own organization, the Visegrad four, uh, that's named for an event that took place in 1345. Uh, <laughs> Uh, only in the European context, I think, would we get such a thing, and I'm really, uh, it's a special privilege to, to welcome you b uh, because of, of all of the special meaning uh, that, that, that we have. And Your Excellencies, uh, uh, Sapari, uh, Gondolovic, Sniff, and Kometz, uh, I think I got, came close on all those, uh, but uh, Your Excellencies, it is, is a great privilege to have you in Atlanta. First, welcome you here. I know you had a wonderful event. Uh, last night with the World Trade uh, Center and a lot of uh, the supporting organizations are here and, and so we welcome you to Atlanta. Some have been here before, but I understand never as a group, in fact, never as a group outside of Washington. This is really great. It's why, of course, we brought in our former chairman and, and uh, wonderful friend, uh, Dennis Lockhart, to be sort of the t uh, participate in the team building exercise that you can have up on the stage a little bit later. But thank you, uh, all of you, for, for uh, being here for this really banner event for, for our, our organization. The World Affairs Council of Atlanta is going on to four years old and we are, are just honored beyond belief. Uh, we understand from Cedric Sussman, uh, who, who uh, over the last decades has been really a central player in these kinds of meetings. We understand I, there have never been four ambassadors uh, on the same stage at the same time uh, and certainly not uh, at this moment uh, in history where it's uh, so important to have these, the dialogue. It was going to be important anyway uh, because of the, of the importance of the four countries, but so here we are. So that, see, yes. So you have to have influence for that. I was an old Navy man, so I will say aye, aye, sir, uh, whatever you spoke, uh, to respond to the, to the captain for that. Thank you very much, uh, uh, security officers. Uh, so we, we thank you. Uh, well, uh, this uh, event, I, I have to take, uh, um, sorry. Your floor is now secure. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, we, will, we will, and thank you very much. It's, it's a voice from on high, and we can all guess who it might be. Uh, we, we'll see. Say whatever you like. You're, you're, please uh, enjoy. Um, the the uh, European Union grant that allows this to happen is also a very important thing to recognize. Uh, we couldn't do this without the European Union, the support of, of, of the European Union in promoting conversations that foster a greater understanding about Europe broadly and generally, but about countries specifically uh, here in Atlanta and the Southeast and more, uh, and more broadly the United States. So we're uh, very happy uh, to have, have all of you here. Uh, it also couldn't be possible without the cooperating organizations. I won't name them all. There are many organizations, including Polish American Chamber of Commerce and others who, who for a long time have been working on Central European matters here in Atlanta and, and many others who have supported this event and we, we thank you for that. Also, the Honorary uh, Consuls General, uh, uh, Ash, uh, Parkinson, and Novak, uh, all, all of you are close friends of ours for a long time. We could not possibly also have done this without the great coordination of the Honorary Consuls General and our own friend and member and colleague, uh, Ambassador Obsitnik, who, who uh, helped facilitate the visit uh, of, of uh, the Ambassador from Slovakia. So we have close 
friends here, and uh, we uh, like to assemble them to talk about these subjects of great importance, uh, facilitating these, these uh, events. Uh, I also did want to recognize, we, um, uh, Your Excellencies, we have, uh, of course, uh, some of you, we've already mentioned uh, Ambassador Obsitnik, uh, uh, but we have ambas former Ambassador to Australia, uh, McCollum, uh, uh, here, here as, as well, and of course you will hear later in the program uh, from Ambassador Ash. So we, we, we are blessed with having other folks in your trade here and, and of, of uh, great diplomatic service that they've uh, done for the United States uh, in, in various postings. We also are privileged to have a lot of support and long engagement from the very uh, outset of not only this event but all of our events. Uh, of the Coca-Cola Company, and we're, it's a great privilege uh, to have here today, get, especially given his impossible schedule, but uh, the president of Coca-Cola International, Amit Bozar. So thank you for being here, Amit. <laughs> and we pre appreciate all of the other, other uh, people who have made this uh, possible. I finally uh, ha have to say, and I take the uh, personal privilege to do this, uh, of course, we have an incredible uh, operating team uh, with Michelle Spink and her whole team, Ina Seferovic, appropriately named for this uh, thing, uh, and uh, others, but, uh, and Claire Higgins-Morton. But this thing absolutely could not have happened without Cedric Sussman. There is nobody who would have even conceived of having four ambassadors on, on the stage at the same time, certainly not uh, being so absolutely focused on having Central Europe as a part of the broader program on Europe that we've had over the last 12 months and for another six or so. But in any case, uh, thank you, Cedric, for, for what is a miraculous, a miraculous performance. So it, with that, uh, I would like to uh, int introduce another uh, great friend, uh, uh, Consul Vasilios uh, Galusis uh, the, of the Consulate of the Republic of Greece. But he is here to welcome you uh, in his role or the country's role in the European Union in the presidency. So, uh, Mr. Consul, please. We've asked him to do the introduction in English, although he could do it in about seven or eight languages, but we'll ask for English today. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you, Cedric, for organizing this. It's a great honor and privilege. We welcome today the four ambassadors of uh, Central European countries of the Czech Republic, of Poland, of Slovakia, and Hungary. It's the second high-level visit from Europe within just a week. Last week last Friday, we had the honor of uh, hosting here the EU Trade Commissioner, Karl de Hucht, who said that within a generation, the um, GDP share of both the United States and Europe combined will have fallen from 50% to 25%. And he also stressed the need to do something about that. Well, what European Union needs and that's what the commissioner said, is fresh ideas. It's reforms we should press ahead with. And it's with great joy that we welcome the four ambassadors here as members of the so-called group V4 or Visegrad 4. Because those groups, the forming of those groups, instead of weakening, they actually strengthen the European Union as our common family. And we look forward to hearing from them about their ideas of how to press ahead with those reforms that are badly needed. We welcome their initiatives. We welcome their ideas. We welcome their contribution as new member states, member states since 2004, to the common goal which is what our EU model says, to find and achieve unity in our diversity. Thank you very much for being here, and welcome once again. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. And the final uh, words of welcome uh, from uh, another uh, great international citizen of, of our city, representing the mayor today, the director of the Office of International Affairs for the City of Atlanta, uh, Claire Angel.
Thank you, Wayne. Good afternoon. Before I start, and it's a great pleasure to be here, but I would like uh, to extend my deep congratulations to the World Affairs Council and also the uh, World Trade uh, Center for putting such an incredible series of events for our first serving ambassador. It's quite a historical moment for Atlanta, and I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Your Excellencies, on behalf of Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed, I would like to extend to you a warm Southern welcome and express my sincere gratitude for your visit to Atlanta. I look forward, as many of us today, to hear from you about the Visegrad countries and its relationship with the United States and our region in particular. Georgia and Atlanta already share strong diplomatic, cultural, and economic ties with Europe and the four countries represented today. In the economic domain alone, Europe remains Georgia's number one trading partner. As a prime example, 60% of all foreign direct investment in the state of Georgia come from Europe, creating tens of thousands of local jobs. And we hope that agreements such as TTIP will reinforce this relationship. Among our European partners, our relationship with central countries such as Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia have experienced an incredible growth in the last decade in particular. I was actually reading last week in the Atlanta Business Chronicle that Poland is now our Georgia's second fastest export um, domain. And, so, uh, and I also uh, know that we have now two Czech Republic investment in the state of Georgia and we look for many more to come. Your Excellency, I hope that this visit will generate many more opportunities to bring our relationship to the next level. We believe that Atlanta has quite a lot to offer, being the host of the world's busiest airport, the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 companies, world-class universities and institutions, an incredible way of life, and many more. And my office is certainly at your disposal to explore this new ground of cooperation. Once again, please accept my sincere thanks for your historical visit on behalf of Mayor Kasim Reed. Thank you. Uh, uh, th uh, thank, thanks, Claire. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, your excellencies, you would like to know that, that that's absolutely the best southern accent we can put up here. <laughs> so uh, we, we, are, we are grateful. Uh, she did mention the great institutions, and, and I would be amiss uh, if I didn't miss mention Dr. Vicki Birchfield, who has also been a real part of planning all of this. We appreciate from Georgia Tech. Uh, and of course, uh, Dean Fenway Cuss of the Robinson College of Business, who's not only a board member of the World Affairs Council, but uh, is the dean of the Robinson College, uh, for whom I work and with whom I work. And we're gra grateful for all the support and the other institutions with whom we have great uh, affinity and, and collaborative uh, work. So uh, with that, I, we will uh, begin the program in a little bit. Please start, enjoy your lunch, and uh, once again, uh, welcome. Please continue to enjoy your luncheon, your, your meal, but I'm going to call on Ambassador Victor Ash, the former U.S. Ambassador to Poland, to introduce our guests. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you, uh, Cedric, for, that, uh, for inviting me to be here. And, uh, of course, uh, I was invited, actually, by my brother, the Honorary Consul, General for the Republic of Poland, and since he's my older brother, I always do whatever he asks. And, uh, and he's accompanied by his uh, former longtime member of the Georgia House of Representatives, Kathy Ash. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize two of my colleagues in the former ambassador category, uh, Robert McCallum, uh, President Bush's ambassador to Australia, and Vince Upstetnik, President Bush's ambassador to Slovakia. I had the privilege of serving as also President Bush's ambassador to the Republic of Poland, uh, where I first got to know uh, uh, Richard Schneff, who's, of course, Poland's ambassador to the United States here today. <coughs> and there's an excellent biography written on each of the ambassadors in your program, which I'll not repeat, but I'll simply give a very brief uh, biographical sketch in order in which uh, the ambassadors will be speaking to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, ambassador Sapari, the ambassador of the Republic of Hungary, is of course the grandson of a former prime minister. 
He fled Hungary with the Budapest uprisings in 1956 and was away from his native country for some 20 plus years, living in Belgium and then in the United States, uh, developing his excellent credentials as an economist, working for the IMF. He was an advisor to the Prime Minister of Hungary and is now Hungary's ambassador to the United States. He will be followed by the ambassador of the Czech Republic, Ambassador Granolovic, uh, who I particularly like in his resume because, like myself, he's a former mayor of a Czech city. I was mayor of the city of Knoxville. But he has an extensive, uh, distinguished background as a member of the Czech Parliament, a member of the Prime Minister's Cabinet as a Minister of Agriculture, and um, has also served as the Consul General of the Czech Republic in New York City. And Prague is, of course, the headquarters of Radio Free Europe, uh, which is still very active, particularly in the former Soviet republics, in broadcasting news that the, uh, many of the governments of those countries probably do not welcome. Uh, he will be followed, of course, by Ambassador Schneff, who his assignment as the Polish ambassador to the United States uh, is the fourth embassy of which he's been the ambassador, having started uh, in Uruguay and Paraguay, uh, and then followed by representing Poland and Costa Rica, but also being accredited to numerous Central American countries at the same time. Then Poland's ambassador to Spain. He worked for a, a former prime minister of Poland during the time that I served as ambassador to Poland, and now uh, represents, of course, Poland here in the United States. He will be followed by Ambassador Kemic of the Slovak Republic, uh, who previous to this was Slovakia's ambassador to Sweden, but he had prior experience in the United States where he served as the Deputy Chief of Mission in the Slovak Embassy in Washington, as well as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Slovakia's Embassy in Tel Aviv and the Republic of Israel. Uh, additionally, he has represented Slovakia in Vienna at the OSCE. As you can see, all four ambassadors have very strong and detailed uh, records of service in their own foreign ministries of their respective nations. And have, again, as has been said earlier, all four visa grad ambassadors here together at the same time is a special treat. And given the state of current events in Ukraine and other parts of the world will be particularly timely to come here on March 11 in the great city of Atlanta. Thank you. Bank of Atlanta. It's my privilege to, to be the moderator. I have the best seat in the house here, and each of the ambassadors will, will deliver some remarks to get us started, and then I'll ask a, a couple of questions, and then we'll have questions from the floor. So I think in the seating order, so Ambassador Zapari, would you like to begin, please? Yes. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. It's a great privilege for me to be here today. Um, and um, particularly at this, this time, because we um, celebrate the 25th anniversary of the fall of economies. You remember in November uh, 89, the Berlin Wall fell, then the Velvet Revolution in, in Prague, in, in uh, Poland as well, uh, and also uh, in Hungary. But there is an Atlanta connection to this, because in the early days of January 1990, there was the American Economic uh, Association meeting here in Atlanta. And I was watching on the, uh, on the TV the fall of, uh, in, of communism in, in Romania. And we had a lot of discussions uh, about that with, with the colleagues. And I was, we had a session that was talking about Russia and China and Central and Eastern Europe. But that was set up as normally a year, a year earlier. So because that wasn't such an interesting uh, topic back in uh, a year earlier, so we had a relatively small room. But because all the events, we had to move to a much, much bigger room, and then even that room wasn't enough, they had to put loudspeakers out in the corridor because there were so many people suddenly interested uh, about our region. Um, <clears throat> so that is my Atlanta connection to this, uh, um, uh, to this event. Now, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the Visegrad Four 
uh, uh, countries. It was formed in 1991 in the city of Visegrad, which is a former royal city um, in Hungary, not far from Budapest. And um, um, you might be interested that the, the uh, population is approximately 65 million people, and its territory is three and a half times bigger than Georgia, if, if that tells you something. Of course, the biggest country is Poland. Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary are, 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 are much smaller. And uh, <clears throat> we have common policies, and we will be talking about this in energy, in security, in economic policies, like the TTIP, for instance, that we have. And we have a very strong uh, 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 cooperation among, among ourselves, uh, our governments, and then, of course, here, the ambassadors in, in, in Washington. And there is another uh, aspect of this, is which we call the Eastern Partnership. Uh, the V4 have initiated Eastern Partnership with countries of Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus, because these are countries that are adjacent to our region. Um, we would like them to see uh, also um, be a member down the road of NATO and the EU, and we are sort of the advocates uh, of, of, of these countries. Now, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the V4 countries have gone through, a, I would say, a very, very successful democratic um, and economic uh, transformation. We turned from a dictatorship into a, into a free democracy, the rule of law, but also economically, um, we have been developing very fast. Actually, the, this region is going faster even now, even now than the developed countries. Uh, Poland is doing especially very well, but overall, uh, we are growing between two and three, three and a half percent, while you know, the Eurozone is around 1% or even less. Some of the countries are, have negative growth. And that is because our countries are a catching up countries. Our productivity is low, so the productivity can still increase very, very substantially. Um, and sooner or later, you know, we will catch up at least with the average of the old Euro countries. And some of, the, some of our countries will be there, uh, there at the top. So the message that I write want to will tell you, this is an area for business to be interested in it and look, look, look into it. it it's, it's going to grow faster than the mature European economies. Now, the, um, let me say a few words about Ukraine, and that would be a topic that each of the ambassadors would, would also talk, um, <clears throat> talk about. You know, Ukraine plays a very, very important role um, between Russia and Europe. Uh, Russia would like to have um, <clears throat> its own power base and its own uh, 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 customs union. But Ukraine is a key player in that because it's the biggest country. Now, Ukraine at one point <clears throat> wanted to go toward uh, Europe, uh, sign an uh, association agreement, and it looked like it will, be, it will be going that way. Russia very much was against that and found the man, Yanukovych, who was, <clears throat> who was um, willing to go the other way. Uh, and Russia gave first of all threatened economic uh, e economic measures if they did did, did go toward the Europe, or economic uh, um, and financial advantages if they turned toward uh, toward Russia. It looked like uh, it, it will turn to Russia because Yanukovych uh, at the last moment refused to uh, to sign the association agreement, and then something unexpected happened on Maidan, where the, the, the Ukraine people started to, to, um, <clears throat> to rise up against, uh, against Yanukovych. And that started a whole new uh, series of events, uh, which led to the likelihood, the likelihood that the Crimea Peninsula will become either independent, autonomous, or maybe part of Russia. And this whole area of, uh, uh, of uh, this is the whole area of discussion. Um, uh, let me just uh, say a few words, and then I let the others to expand on this. Uh, the V4 supports the, the um, current uh, uh, government of Ukraine, does not consider that Yanukovych is the president. 
supports the elections that were announced for the 25th of May in Ukraine, is against the referendum in Crimea that would are supposed to uh, <clears throat> uh, vote on whether Crimea should leave Ukraine um, altogether, and uh, <clears throat> are trying to help in, a, in any ways that it can um, the new Ukrainian government uh, within the framework of the, uh, of the EU. And um, <clears throat> I would like to stop here. Uh, this is my part of the work, and I'm sure that the others would look at, the other ambassadors would look at different aspects of the Ukrainian crisis as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Schnepp. Okay, this is my turn. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much for inviting us here. It uh, gave us a unique opportunity to meet V4 uh, ambassadors not in DC as usually we do, but go out and meet in Atlanta. Who knows, perhaps this meeting will, will, will be uh, inscribed into the history of the Visegrad group countries as an important <laughs> meeting. So we are witnessing uh, something new. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about a security, and as you perfectly know, uh, security is everything. And we happen to experiences while entering this hall, but we now know that we are secure. Is security is everywhere. It's health security, it's food security, it's a military uh, security, energy security. I could prolong it, and believe me, these are the old papers I have prepared, but I will not bore you with that. I will share with you some personal uh, uh, remarks. Well, as uh, Hungarian ambassador said, we are celebrating this year a 25th anniversary of the big change, not only in Central Europe, but a global change, actually, because uh, the change in countries like Czechoslovakia at that time, Hungary, Poland, reunification of Germany, and this process that was just begun at that moment meant a change for the whole global politics. It also changes by a uh, polar world where on one side we had the Western world and the communist world on the other side. Some people say today that uh, it was not good, of course, particularly for us, but at least it was clear, the good and bad. Today it's a little bit more confused, and sometimes we have to explain where the, the real democracy is. I used to say to my uh, American friends that they may look around and have many friends. They may do a wonderful business with any country in the world. But when we come to the point where the security is discussed that we would be only Europe that stands behind the United States simply because we share your values. If we talk, uh, a Polish ambassador, Hungarian, Czech, or Slovak ambassador to his American friends, and we are talking about the democracy, we all know what we mean. Talk to somebody else from a different continent and say democracy. He will reply you, okay, what we mean to telling democracy is this and that. This is a little bit different way of meaning of the word democracy. What uh, human rights are, we know what the human rights are. We don't uh, have a, a dispute about the human rights because we know what it means. It means the equal rights for all people. The free access to the media, uh, the transparent elections, non-corruptive government, transparency in the public world. We all know that. This is why it's so important that the security matters between Europe and the United States, and particularly between our four countries, Visegrad group countries, and the United States should be always on mind 
and being taken, taken care of very carefully. Uh, we face today a, a completely different situation than uh, we might think, uh, let's say, a few weeks ago. Something has changed, and this is very important change. George just uh, said a couple of words about the, the situation in Ukraine. I will put it more generally. Probably a month ago, two months ago, we thought that we could talk, we could have a partner to discuss difficult issues on our east. I'm talking about the Russian Federation. It is vitally important to us, we are not anti-Russians, to have a good neighbor. You know what it means to have a good, stable, democratic neighbor, prosperous neighbor, you can have a, a healthy trade with. We want to have a good neighbor. We want to have a healthy Ukraine and to see a change in Russia as well. Only a few weeks ago, we could think about getting together and talk about the future. Uh, different ambitious plans to go through G8 in Sochi or the World Trade Organization and to develop the, all the mechanisms that in the democratic world are common. Today, we have to forget about it. The world has changed because we are facing a unique situation that I think the President Barack Obama said correctly, unthinkable in 2014 to have one country grab a part of another country and say, it's mine. Imagine such situation among our country. We, have, we, we might find a lot of problems between ourselves as well. Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic. We have the strong Polish community in Bielorus, in Lithuania, a member of NATO and member of the European Union. Imagine the situation that tomorrow we declare. We need to have a part of, of Lithuania, and this is a Vilnius, is the most Polish uh, place in Lithuania, the region, because we will take care of the interests of now our minority leaders there. Or we enter the Belarus. We all know that in today's world, there are the international organizations, the internationally accepted instruments to solve such problems, to deliver the complaint to the proper place, and to get the, the international public interested in solving it, instead of reaching out to uh, the international uh, organizations, Moscow sent the tanks. We all remember, actually, well, actually we, as we sit here, Prague, 1968, Budapest in 56, Poland being ge jeopardized during the solidarity period. We all know what it means. It means that if we agree, if we forget about what, what's, what happened right now, if we let that the Olympic Games or the, the Soccer uh, World Cup will take our interest to other issues, as it happened with Georgia. We will open the door to further uh, activities of that sort. We'll have Moldavia next. We'll have perhaps the Baltic countries. We'll have perhaps Poland. This is why we consider NATO as an important pillar of our security. We all are members, and we want to celebrate the enlargement of NATO peacefully and joyfully. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the right time for festivities. The American uh, government reacted properly. We are glad, we are satisfied with a new initiative, namely to strengthening the air policing, which is the sending new aircraft, uh, patrolling the air over Baltic countries. We are satisfied uh, with the decision of sending 12 F-16 to Poland. 
not because we want war. This is because we feel that the American support, the American commitment toward our region is serious. That in a time of, a, of, uh, of difficulty, we can count on this partnership. So let this Congress take care of it. Let the President take of it. Take care of it to be more present. The U Europe needs the United States. Uh, we understand uh, the pivot, the Asian orientation of the, of the American policy. The global security is our security as well. We understood that. But the Ukrainian security is also the global security, even more. Because we feel this, this danger, not only we, you f will feel it too here in DC, in Chicago, and in Atlanta. So I call you to be active, not to let the politician forget about the security of, of Central Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I'm so. Uh, uh, humble that uh, you all uh, gathered uh, to listen to us and to listen to uh, the problems, how we see uh, the uh, security situation in our region from our um, perspective. I will try to turn your attention to uh, uh, the energy uh, part of uh, security, uh, the uh, um, security of energy supplies. Of course, if we gathered uh, sometime in uh, uh, early 2000s, we would probably be speaking on uh, the challenges, how to, uh, how to supply growing demand for energy while uh, taking care of the environment and uh, uh, climate change. But even uh, if we gathered some around uh, 2009, we would already have uh, had such an experience when, uh, as a result of a pricing dispute between Russia and Ukraine, uh, the gas uh, supplies were cut off from a pretty uh, significant, significant uh, part of Eastern uh, Central Europe, even affecting uh, Germany. Uh, you may remember the gas uh, crisis of early uh, 2009, which means that it was uh, then a sort of a wake-up call uh, that uh, we have to look at uh, energy not only from the perspective of uh, supplies and environmental protection, but also uh, from the perspective of national uh, security. Uh, then uh, the European Union reacted, uh, reacted uh, very swiftly. By the way, uh, on uh, the political uh, side of the problem, uh, the EU then just founded a uh, so-called Eastern Partnership, an instrument how the European Union uh, supports uh, the six uh, former uh, Soviet Union countries, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And this still is a very important tool. Unfortunately, the uh, situation has uh, rather changed, and some of the countries are not uh, particularly happy about uh, their um, um, being uh, under the attention or support of the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, mainly Belarus uh, um, doesn't uh, support it. But that's a different, uh, different story. Uh, so um, uh, on the energy security, much uh, uh, progress has also been done in Europe, uh, particularly in uh, connecting uh, our countries with alternative uh, gas uh, pipeline connections. And while most of the gas pipelines uh, before 2009 used to go from Russia through Ukraine, Slovakia, and uh, uh, west of Europe, uh, now it's, uh, of course, uh, our ambition to create a, a north-south uh, connection that would uh, uh, connect Poland uh, eventually with Croatia in Adriatic Sea. Um, Russia, at the same time, of course, uh, 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 didn't uh, um, uh, stop uh, uh, trying to circumvent uh, Ukraine with its uh, uh, connection to Europe. So together with Germany and other countries, they completed uh, the so-called Nord Stream that is actually 
on the bottom of the Baltic Sea connecting uh, Russian uh, Federation with, uh, uh, directly with Germany. So that is uh, uh, some sort of uh, Russian uh, contribution to uh, um, diversity of supplies, which uh, uh, as a matter of fact may now uh, um, serving as a, a stabilizing factor because uh, while there might be some problems between uh, Russia and Ukraine, Russia cannot easily uh, cut off uh, Germany from, uh, from its natural gas uh, uh, deliveries. Uh, not only that it would be a real problem for Russia then, but also that Russia, as much as we need Russian gas, Russia needs to sell its gas and it needs its customers. So uh, paradoxically, this Nord Stream may eventually serve as a stabilizing factor even for Slovakia and eventually to Ukraine because in the meantime we have succeeded in um, uh, making, uh, making the uh, gas uh, connections uh, actually reversible so that not only we can uh, transport gas from the east to the west but uh, as, it is, as it might be uh, necessary we may, we may just revert uh, that uh, mechanism and supply gas from west uh, to, uh, to the east. Is it going to be Russian gas for time being? Probably yes, but again, this might be somehow uh, gas that already is in Europe and will be, uh, will be uh, supplied uh, uh, at least uh, to eastern part of Europe and maybe eventually to Ukraine after the connector between Ukraine and Slovakia is, uh, is ready. And what is the role of the United States? Of course, we all know that the United States has uh, uh, turned the tables uh, in energy uh, world. It has, uh, from the net importer, become net exporter of energy. And particularly in gas, it means that even though there is not much gas export from the United States to, uh, to the outside world yet, it still has changed the uh, the game already because uh, obviously as it is not consuming gas coming from the, the outside world, uh, it has created uh, 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 pressure on the gas prices uh, elsewhere. And also now, as you know, and we all uh, debated under the light of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, um, US uh, Congress is debating uh, a number of bills uh, which actually mean the same, enable American gas uh, to be exported to Europe. Uh, we've discussed that a uh, uh, couple of uh, years already. Uh, we appreciate concerns that, uh, uh, mm, that are uh, from different sides of the table in America. Obviously, uh, there is a different uh, position of uh, the gas uh, industry as uh, uh, there is a different position of the consumers. Obviously, the cheaper gas has, uh, um, has enabled the uh, American economy uh, start, uh, to start and uh, using uh, uh, less uh, expensive energy. And of course, there are many industries uh, that wish to keep, that, uh, keep it like that. But at the same time, uh, at this very moment, we are convinced that uh, it is important that the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, makes it possible to export gas at least at least to its allies, let's say members of NATO. Of course, uh, uh, we do not want to forget Japan and other countries, but uh, I think that the discussion is relevant to which countries uh, uh, the administration would have uh, uh, such uh, automatic uh, uh, per permitting uh, uh, process rather than a lengthy evaluation process which eventually uh, takes a couple of years or something like that. Even if uh, today or tomorrow uh, US Congress and uh, eventually uh, U.S. president would sign in the law that uh, American gas is possible to be exported uh, to Europe. It would change a lot in today's situation because it would be a signal that diversity is, avail uh, is, is the fact that uh, other gas is available rather than uh, only coming from uh, the east to us. And I would urge you that uh, 
you would use your uh, uh, authority as uh, the World Affairs Council and other organizations I see uh, gathered in this room that you support the idea that the U.S. would uh, enable uh, the, uh, uh, the gas uh, uh, to be exported uh, to Europe. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> Ambassador Kamesh. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really my pr privilege uh, to speak uh, to such a distinguished audience. And uh, I'm lucky uh, to speak about the topic uh, uh, transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership. Why am I lucky? Because uh, I'm in a state and uh, uh, among the audience uh, that is uh, very uh, business friendly and uh, free trade oriented. So uh, you might not need a lot, lot of explanation why, why this agreement is important uh, for uh, transatlantic uh, partnership. Uh, we, uh, all four of us, uh, are very strong supporters uh, of this uh, free trade agreement with the United States. And uh, uh, that's a part of our transition and democratization process. Uh, we always uh, look uh, into the United States as a strategic partner. At the initial phase, it was uh, uh, partnering uh, in, uh, in the areas of security, uh, democratization, and transition of the societies. And uh, you, you did a very good job in Central Europe. Uh, all the success stories uh, in four of our countries is just the proof of that, uh, so that uh, all the potential and uh, uh, investments by the United States uh, to Central Europe uh, paid off. And uh, we, have, we have flourishing partnerships uh, in businesses, number of multinationals uh, in, uh, uh, from the United States uh, uh, have uh, great uh, experience in Central Europe and we want to, we want to develop it. Uh, we see uh, this agreement as, uh, as a new uh, economic NATO uh, that uh, even more important uh, in the times uh, when we speak about the uh, situation in Ukraine so that uh, economy plays a uh, really important role in, uh, in our partnership that uh, make uh, uh, our strategic links uh, a longer term and sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, cooperation and, uh, and uh, a partnership. Uh, I will just use uh, a couple of uh, uh, statistical figures. I would uh, put them into two, two, uh, uh, two clusters. One cluster is external cluster and uh, I would just like to highlight one figure that uh, if we sign this uh, agreement, uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, we will uh, actually uh, uh, create 40% uh, of uh, global trade. Uh, that means that uh, we, will s we, will s we will become uh, a standard setters. Uh, it is very important from the perspective that uh, not only uh, free market, uh, but also a democratic uh, democratic way of doing business, uh, the free, uh, free society, uh, rule of law, uh, protection of intellectual property are combined with, uh, with, uh, uh, with free, free market rules. And that's very important to other parts of the world. Uh, if we set up these standards on the 40% of, uh, uh, of free trade, I think that we'll have much more better negotiating positions uh, toward other big players of uh, G20, let's say. Uh, the second set of uh, s uh, statistical figures uh, play important role domestically on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, for example, uh, if we sign the agreement, uh, we will uh, increase our uh, trade uh, by 150 billion US dollars. We'll increase our GDP uh, by 250 billion US dollars. We'll create a new uh, 500,000 jobs, uh, that conservative assessment uh, in terms of uh, more a uh, more optimistic scenario will be creating up to 2 million jobs uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. So these are uh, extremely interesting figures from the point of view of politicians. So I think that uh, it's up to them now uh, to speed up the process and finalize it. Uh, I think that negotiating teams under the able uh, leadership of uh, Commissioner De Hucht and uh, US Trade Commissioner Froman are, are the teams that uh, really show the, uh, the leadership and. Uh, are devoted uh, to finalize the agreement uh, as soon as possible. Now it's up to the uh, legislators uh, to, uh, to react, and uh, uh, we would encourage you 
to, to work with your uh, members of Congress uh, uh, to, uh, to have this agreement on, on, uh, implemented as soon as possible. Uh, I would like to also make a parallel to the situation in Ukraine, how free trade uh, is, uh, is important, also from the perspective of uh, our countries. Uh, when we were joining uh, uh, the European Union, or even before, uh, before we, when the borders opened, uh, we saw the big difference between, uh, between the West uh, and uh, the East when we started traveling and uh, 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 shopping, shopping in neighboring countries like Austria, Germany. Uh, we could see the huge difference uh, in, uh, in the development uh, at that time in the West and in, in the East. And uh, the things changed completely. Uh, even in, uh, in Austria, Burgenland and Niederösterreich, these are the two regions that are neighboring, uh, uh, neighboring Hungary and uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, where the belong to, to the least developed uh, uh, regions of the European Union. After the opening of borders, uh, they are one of the most flourishing regions in the European Union. Bratislava on, on the other side of the, of the wall has become the fifth uh, richest uh, uh, region in the European Union when it comes to the uh, GDP per capita. It enjoys 183% of EU average. So this is uh, uh, excellent uh, proof of uh, how, how opening of borders uh, and free trade play an uh, important role. The same could be applied to Ukraine. If we, uh, if we uh, invite Ukraine at least to implement uh, a deep, uh, comprehensive uh, free trade agreement uh, with the European Union, uh, we will we'll immediately see uh, the profits uh, both uh, for the eastern parts of uh, the, e uh, the EU regions uh, in Poland, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, but also on the other side uh, of, uh, of the border of the European Union in Western Ukraine that needs new investments uh, because, as you know, uh, Ukraine economy is very much uh, uh, Russian-oriented. Uh, all the uh, large businesses uh, are located in eastern part of the Ukraine. So opening of the EU borders uh, to, to Ukraine would, would mean a lot uh, for the western part in order to balancing, balancing the, uh, the businesses. Uh, we are lucky that uh, currently the Ukraine oligarchs, uh, even from the east, are keen to cooperate uh, rather with the European Union uh, than, uh, than, than with Russia. Currently they are afraid of, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this uh, military invasion as well. Uh, they already have uh, more, more businesses uh, doing with the European Union than, than with Russia. So we have to grasp this opportunity and use the potential currently. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, I will lead with one or two questions and then we'll open the, the floor to questions. Um, I'd like you to expand a little bit more on the Ukraine. Obviously, it's on everyone's mind. Here, here in the United States, there have been press articles to the effect that this is a renewal of the Cold War, and you who are close to it are no doubt have a much more realistic sense of, of what's the range of possibilities here. How could this go very well? How could it go badly? But what is a realistic set of of, of possible scenarios. Could you address that? Yes, sir. Yes, um, let me just quickly uh, uh, <clears throat> add something about energy that uh, <clears throat> Petri said, that we, the V4 ambassadors, we wrote a letter to um, Boehner, John Boehner, and also to uh, Harry Reid to uh, ask for, <clears throat> for the Congress and the administration by the Congress to speed up uh, LNG exports to, the, to Europe, which would then, of course, sig send a signal to Russia that maybe he cannot use that uh, uh, gas, as a, uh, gas as, a, as a pressure on Ukraine. And this got a lot of publicity uh, in the Congress and also in the press, and um, hopefully it might lead to something. Another point is that how uh, the West is beginning to, to look at uh, the V4 countries as, a, as an important group in this particular case of Ukraine is that the German uh, foreign minister just invited the V4 foreign ministers for Thursday to discussing this issue. So 
the V4 is becoming, in the case of Ukraine, uh, a sort of an influential, um, an influential um, <clears throat> a group of countries, and in particular Poland, being the biggest country, and it's, uh, it's um, uh, Poland's um, <clears throat> foreign minister Sikorsky has played a very, very important role, and the V4 minister's statement actually even paid tribute to, the, uh, to that in their statement. So um, Poland is doing, doing really its work. Now, on Ukraine, let me tell you something. You know, I had the, um, what would I say, chance, privilege, or, or something else, that I lived through 1956 in Budapest. And there is a very interesting parallel. Uh, the Russians called the people on the streets the fascists. You know, the fascists are there. You know? And then they always find somebody who would call in the Russian army. And, uh, you know, they did find Kada. They call it invite. They invite. Invite the Russian army. The Russians don't like to go in just like that. They have to be invited. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, they were invited also in this particular case by Yanukovych. Yanukovych actually wrote a letter. I don't know how they um, how managed it, but how, how they convinced Yanukovych. But there is a letter. It was at the, presented at the UN in which he called in uh, the Russian army to help uh, the population. Uh, against the, 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 the fascist uh, uh, throngs, you know. So um, this is, you know, it's very interesting to see this parallel. One would have thought that, you know, it has changed, but it hasn't changed. So this is number one. Number two, um, as I said, Russia is looking to have a, a, a little bit of an empire. I'm not saying that it wants to redo the whole Soviet Union, but it wants to be bigger, have a bigger influence. Probably it's coming from the fact that they realize that you know, they cannot be a member of the EU because it's too big and they don't want to be a member of EU. They want to have their own, their own um, influence. And for that, they need, they think they need more territory or Ukraine, maybe Belarus, maybe part of Georgia, part of Moldova, et cetera. They're doing at least under, under Putin. So we have to uh, be strong and show that we, you know, we, um, uh, we um, uh, don't accept that, but it's going to be difficult. You know, let's face it, if, if uh, Crimea secedes, you know, it's a fait, fait accompli, just like in the case of Georgia or in the case of um, Moldova. And this situation, and this is my personal view, this situation uh, could be seen, it would be coming, because um, if you see a country like the US, which is, you know, the, the most important country uh, in the West and in the NATO, that you know, you withdraw from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't withdraw, but just I'm just saying withdraw from Iran. Not really engaged in Libya, flip flop on Syria, reducing the defense expenditures here. You know, this whole thing together uh, gives a feeling of a perception that maybe this other side is not as strong, and then when the, the people are, are Putin begins to use its, its force. So it's very important that the, if, to realize that if the US shows weakness overall, overall, then a vacuum is created and somebody else is going to try to fill that vacuum. So the US, United States has, has, has a role to play. And we all know that the United States has taken enormous uh, sacrifices in the First World War, the Second World War, in Yugoslavia, etc. But my feeling is that, you know, the history has given this power to the United States, still attracting all the best minds from the rest of the world, has the resources. It is the only country that can uh, defend uh, the Western democracies um, and, of course, be par partnering with Europe. So let's not forget that. Thank you very much. Mm. Well, uh, uh, I mean, uh, whatever uh, Georgi said, is, uh, it was uh, very well said, but uh, at the same time, we should maintain that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, has to remain uh, territorially intact. Uh, this has been the position of uh, the EU, uh, the European Union, and also of the United States. I wish to express that uh, uh, we may be pessimistic, we may uh, uh, doubt how that can be arranged, but uh, uh, we need to maintain 
such, such position that uh, the territorial integrity of uh, sovereign state uh, Ukraine needs to be maintained. Let me switch to, um, maybe if I may, yes, one, one more aspect uh, uh, about Ukraine. Uh, uh, we should be aware of the fact that uh, Ukraine uh, society is uh, uh, very strong in terms, uh, in terms of uh, showing their direction. So the civic society in Ukraine is very vibrant, and uh, it showed it in last uh, last decade already two times uh, in the Orange Revolution and currently uh, after Yanukovych refused to sign association agreement. And uh, uh, we shouldn't be afraid about uh, the the clear orientation of the majority of the population. So uh, it, it's never to be an imposed solution uh, for Ukrainians. You know, if we work with them. Uh, and uh, actually help them uh, to, to join the Western structures because uh, uh, there is uh, actually now very intense uh, Russian propaganda explaining that uh, most of the Ukrainians uh, don't want uh, this and it's just the appearance of uh, some fascist and nationalist uh, forces. But we clearly see that uh, Ukrainians went to the street and we have to help them uh, from abroad. Thank and we are we run out of time or just a few words? No, please. Again. Uh, you probably know <clears throat> that from the historical perspective, uh, the better doing society, richer society, more, more prosperous society, less belligerent. The Russians, they know that. Uh, more than 50 years ago, Nikita Khrushchev put on trial uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy in the United States in, around Cuba at first. They were, they were convinced that the Western world wouldn't move a finger uh, to defend its right because uh, it's a natural that the uh, rich society is uh, trying to keep the, what they, the life they, they have, not to go out, not to struggle against others. Uh, they know it now. And they see that some of the European countries are are not convinced to take the strong measures simply because they have all the particular interests or they feel like the Ukrainian issue is a distant issue. And uh, I'm not quoting very often the, 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 the communist leaders, but Lev Trotsky was right. This is not important that uh, you don't want the war. The importance is the war, the war wants you. And this is the situation that we cannot give up simply. Because the territorial integrity of an important country and the middle of Europe, this is, this is Central Europe as a matter of fact. Ukraine put on an important strategic uh, uh, crossroads. The country that may change the future of Russian Federation as well and our history we cannot let it go simply because we are uh, because we want to watch TV, for example, and the movies, because we want the comfortable life. Let me change the focus to your four domestic political situations. Uh, an article recently in Foreign Affairs, an important <laughs> journal here in the United States, uh, made the argument that in terms of Western democratic governance, the countries of Eastern Europe, perhaps with the exception of Poland, had lost some ground or were going through challenges. Uh, could you comment on that? And you are relatively new democracies by Western standards. Um, how would you respond to that, that critique? Yes. Uh, that, I presume that critique <laughs> is, is, is mostly, mostly applied to Hungary. Um, I haven't seen that applied to, and, and to Romania, no, not, to, not so much to, to the other countries. I mean, Hungary is, um, you should know that Hungary was the first country that started um, to uh, build down communism by setting out a round table in 1988. And under the shadow of the Soviet army, uh, peacefully, they started around the round table to discuss how there will be free elections in 1990. So as a result, many, many of the laws, including the constitution, but election laws, et cetera, there were compromises. Compromises because the two parts, they were very, very uh, distrustful from each, 
from each other. So they, they um, did the minimum that they could do to have free elections and free, uh, free media, free speech, etc., parliamentary, parliamentary democracy. And because they were fearing that the other one would be able to change, so they made many, many laws that require a two-third majority. And uh, <clears throat> so we didn't have a sudden change like folding the Berlin Wall or, or uh, uh, the, the Prague or, or even, even in, in Warsaw. So it was a smooth going into it. And uh, <clears throat> so that worked for 20 years, except that everybody wanted only to change those laws, but nobody had two-third majority. This time in 2010, the center-right government of Viktor Orban got two-third majority. So they started to set out to make those changes. And change creates conflict. And, uh, and um, uh, you have the choice of not doing anything, or, or you take your responsibility and you begin to make changes. There were some mistakes made, but by very, very not as much as, as it has appeared in the media and, and, and the press. And, um, and I think overall, uh, you, Hungary will come out of it uh, a stronger democracy um, and uh, with stronger rules. There will be less a desire to change the laws because it, was, it has been satisfying most of, the, most of the desires that previously other parties also wanted to change. So as far as Hungary is concerned, I think um, we will have elections now on April 6th. Um, and um, I don't know who's, who's going to win. Uh, the uh, the uh, poll shows that the center right current government is go going to win, but uh, it's ain't open until the flat lady sings. So um, <clears throat> we will see. But I, I think after that, the, um, the 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 narrative around this would would and I hope very much so would would taper off. Let let me open the floor to maybe one or two questions, and although it's very awkward. I have a two o'clock, so I'm going to get up and leave, and then Cedric Susman will close. But is there, are there questions from the floor? And there yes. are two microphones. Uh, yes. Uh, Hi, my name is Jeanette Miller. I've had the privilege of working extensively in all four of your countries, and I have actually lived in three of the countries. All, my, my time in your countries was prior to your admittance into the, into the European Union. So my question for you, and I, I appreciate all of your comments today. It's very, um, very unique and, and engaging to have you here today. With the continued expansion or discussion for expansion of the European Union, do you see that as a security measure for the European Union and increased um, economic stabilization? Or do, you do, you, do your countries see continued expansion of the European Union as an economic burden that be, with the events of the past five years in Europe, do you find that an economic burden as we move forward in this current history? Well, maybe uh, as uh, 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 Peter Kmet, uh, Slovak ambassador, just said, uh, uh, it's the opposite. It's uh, um, an economic opportunity that uh, uh, regions uh, which were isolated by uh, uh, impenetrable borders, uh, uh, border uh, start uh, doing business with each other and uh, uh, they actually prosper. So we see uh, the expansion of the European Union as an opportunity. At the same time, there are challenges that, has, that have to be taken care of. I mean, uh, obviously social uh, um, levels are different. Uh, it leads to uh, increased uh, mobility of, uh, uh, of uh, people. If it is uh, uh, labor force, it is OK as long as rules are uh, 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 met or obey, obeyed. If it is uh, something which is meant to be uh, just a burden to the welfare system that might be different from country to country, it is a problem, and we have to discuss it openly. But uh, again, uh, these uh, mm, problems are uh, vastly prevailed by the opportunities that the ex expansion brings about, uh, not only the, in the economic uh, area, but also in the uh, shared values. It's not uh, by any, uh, mm, it's not a coincidence that even at the time of economic crisis in Europe, uh, mm, 
uh, countries in the Western Balkans still maintain uh, their objective to become uh, full members of European Uni Union and their publics uh, uh, support that goal. So it's, uh, there has to be something about the European Union that is still attractive. If I may uh, add a couple of items. Uh, it may look like some countries are richer, better organized countries are paying for those countries who are easier in spending money. But uh, the truth is that uh, we all need uh, the partners. And uh, if you look at the country that is putting, like Germany, to rescue the, the Greek economy or, or Spanish economy or Irish economy, but we have to remember at the same time uh, that uh, this is the strongest economically country, Germany, that is selling its goods. So uh, the prosperity in other countries makes uh, the, the German economy growing. So uh, this is a uh, very uh, um, multifaceted world of, of joint economy. And despite the crisis, we see it growing in the future. The problem was, but you, of course, you remember that, that the crisis you had also here, the financial crisis, particularly in the construction uh, sector, the, the problem came from uh, the way the Eurozone was organized. Means that the countries adopted a different economic policy, different social policy, at the same time being members of the same currency zone. So it put the, the, the inequalities and uh, unnecessary changes. Today, uh, the system of uh, control, first of all, of spendings by different countries is much more effective than it, than it was, uh, let's say, four years ago. And it looks like the tendency is for, uh, for a growth next year. And the, generally, the European economy is strong and very innovative. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Yes, I'd like to thank all four of you for coming. It's really made us understand the impact of the incursion, the Russian incursion in Ukraine on your countries. I just have a question uh, for Ambassador Tsipari, and that is, you mentioned there's an upcoming election soon in Hungary. The um, Jabbik party uh, gained a lot of momentum in 2010 the Javik Party is, a, is clearly an anti-Semitic, anti-Roma, anti-gay party in Hungary. And Hungary is the home of the third largest Jewish community in Europe. Because of the rise of anti-Semitism, um, as symbolized by the rise of the Javik Party, what has your country done to try to combat anti-Semitism in Hungary? Um, yes, um, you know, what... There is no, I don't think there is an increase in anti-Semitism. There is just an appearance in the public because we have an extreme right party, which is the Jobbik, who started to do that. What we have been, uh, particularly what this government has been doing, is um, um, uh, declared zero tolerance about uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, it was this government that previously, when it was in, in, uh, in power in 1998 and 2002, initiated the opening of the Holocaust Museum, which there is now a Holocaust Museum in, 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 in Hungary, uh, made it compulsory to teach Holocaust in the schools, um, then uh, uh, has organized, has uh, 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 declared that this year is the, because it's the 70th, 70th year of Holocaust in Hungary, so this year is the, uh, the Holocaust Remembrance Year. Um, so it has been doing a lot. Unfortunately, of course, uh, uh, there, is, uh, the, the, there are those voices, uh, but uh, coming from this extreme right party, it's hopefully it might, might lose uh, during these elections a little bit of its, uh, of its power. And also, Hungary uh, has uh, been selected for 2015 to be the chairman of the Holocaust Remembrance uh, Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Um, so it's doing a, doing a lot, but basically what you have to do is to change the hearts and minds of people. You know, Holocaust in, in Central and Eastern Europe is, um, uh, has been 
under the communists, put under the rugs. Nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it. Um, I've said many times that uh, because of the vagaries of my family, I, my 12 years in, uh, in, in schooling, uh, uh, from elementary to high school, I did it 10 different schools. Roughly half in Budapest, the other half in the other parts of the country. I never heard in class about Holocaust. Never heard. Uh, under communism, it was a taboo. So now as democracy is coming, people start to talk about it. However, the people who are talking about now, they heard about the Holocaust from their parents or their grandparents. It's an entirely different society to which you have to explain and, um, and uh, uh, raise the empathy, empathy. That's the most important thing, compassion and empathy. That's what you have to see. So that goes through education, remembrance, museums, books, etc. So that's, that's the work uh, that uh, lies ahead of us. As far as the Romas are concerned, when Hungary had the European um, presidency in the first half of 2011, uh, made a Roma strategy which uh, asked the other uh, countries to accept, uh, which was accepted, and then each country would fill that with actual, um, actual policies. But it's, Hungary is very, very much aware of the, of the Roma situation. Uh, right now, you know, the statistics show that in about, uh, in 2025, about 20% of the new entrants to the labor force will be Romas in Hungary. Uh, and must be similar in some other countries also, Bulgaria, Romania, etc. because it's a much faster growing population. So it's a key question of how you can integrate them into the society. And again, education, jobs, etc. that's what you have to do. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Would any of the other ambassadors like to briefly comment before we have to close uh, the luncheon on this issue of uh, anti-Semitism or Roma issues or let's indeed call it uh, civil and human rights issues as a closing remark perhaps? Well, as you probably know, Poland had the biggest uh, Jewish community before the war, over three million uh, people, which was... Uh, uh, disappeared due to the Holocaust, to the, to the mass murder by the German Nazi. And uh, to live with this history and with the postures of individual people during the war, it is very difficult. We, as George said, we rediscover the many histories that confirm that they were heroic positions, postures of many people, but at the same time, another part of the society didn't pass the, the exam of the humanity. The hatred sometimes, and mostly indifference, were the most popular positions of the people during the war in Poland. At the same time, we have the biggest number of those who rescued the Jewish lives, Jewish neighbors during the war, uh, risking uh, the life of their families and even neighbors. This was a particularly uh, specific policy of the uh, occupational forces in Poland, condemning to the death penalty not only those who were rescuing, but also those who been living in the same house to create the atmosphere of threat and terror, to force people to, uh, to give the information about the, 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 the Jewish people being in, hidden. Uh, Polish Solidarity Revolution at the end of the 80s was built upon a great call for the truth. Of course, at the very beginning we fought the glorious truth about the cutting, about the Warsaw Uprising, and many other heroic or tragic moments in our history. But with that, also the dark parts, dark pages, dark pages of our history came to the, to the world. And we are openly discussing, talking about it. We are, in Warsaw, uh, this year we will have 
a great opening of the, uh, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, which is, uh, I would say, comparable with the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, initiative and great uh, construction, very contemporary and moving, which shows the, the more than 1,000 years history of the uh, joint life on the Polish territory of those who were uh, Poles as well, only of a Jewish faith. But it's a very difficult uh, subject, and uh, Poland is constantly uh, showing through these movies and theater, not only the brightest part of our history, but also the most difficult to discuss it to open these uh, uh, problems. Probably a unique operation in the world. We know other countries that are very reluctant to, to talk or to open the archives and to talk about the, uh, this situation that, that bring them into the shame. We try to uh, enhance the, the openness policy to have a frank speech and, and this is the proper way uh, to, to live uh, with your own history, through the truth. Well, oh. uh, Your Excellency, do you, want, do you want to comment, Ambassador? Uh, or uh, we I, got, I, I just we should say that on. Uh, I was wishing we would uh, be ending on a rather lighter note. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, we would uh, let you uh, depressed for the rest of the day. Um, I just say first, the Czech Republic is uh, probably the number one ally of the state of Israel. It has proven many, many times uh, uh, in recent, uh, uh, recent uh, dealings. And also, uh, uh, Prague is one of the most beautiful uh, Jewish uh, sites uh, in Europe. So you're all invited to, uh, to, to Prague and to uh, see uh, uh, the Jewish quarters and uh, uh, the beautiful synagogues. And, uh, of course, that is not only Prague that apply, applies uh, uh, to Bratislava and uh, Warsaw and Budapest. But uh, again, let's uh, see it uh, from that uh, more positive uh, perspective. We do a lot. You can make a tour to different capitals and trying Palinka, Good beer, not real beer, yes. and good vodka. Look at him. It's it's a it's a better note. <laughs>